Technology is changing at a breakneck speed. It's evolving and advancing so quickly that there are some crazy things on the horizon in terms of how technology is going to impact the world. But what are these crazy things that are gonna happen in the future? That's what I wanna talk about here today. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm the CEO of Third Stage Consulting. We're an independent consulting firm that helps clients throughout the world on their digital transformation journeys. And I've recently published a video that talks about my top 10 digital transformation predictions for 2023. And you can find that video right here. But what I want to do today is not just talk about next year. In fact, I'm not even going to talk about the next few years. I'm going to talk a decade out or decades out from now in terms of how technology that's evolving and advancing today, how that's going to affect the world and how it's going to affect the technology industry in the future. Now, I'll admit these are some far-fetched ideas. They may or may not happen, but if you get creative and stick with me, I think you'll find that there might be some nuggets of truth in what I'm saying here today. Now, before I jump into these crazy tech predictions for the future, I encourage you to download our digital transformation report. It's an annual report we publish each year that covers digital transformation trends, best practices, tips, and lessons learned, as well as independent reviews and rankings of technologies that you could be considering for your organization. So if you're also looking for a view of trends and predictions for right now, I encourage you to download that report and you can find a link to that in the description field below. So with all that being said, let's jump in. The first crazy prediction that I have for the 2030s and beyond is that artificial intelligence is not only going to become mainstream, but it's going to become so mainstream that it's likely to create a level playing field and essential equality across organizations throughout the world. The reason for this is if you cast your mind forward and think about AI advancing, becoming more used by organizations throughout the world, organizations figure out how to clean up the data and migrate the data that's been dirty for all these years and decades, they finally figure out a way to get clean data into their artificial intelligence models and on top of that, they figure out how to access other sources of data through Internet of Things, through third-party data sources, internal enterprise systems, et cetera. Now, all of a sudden, you have organizations that have artificial intelligence models that will essentially equalize. So you'll have organizations that are relying on the same data, the same artificial intelligence models, and it's going to be harder for them to create any sort of meaningful competitive advantage. So in other words, Artificial intelligence is likely to create a situation where there's a commoditization of organizations. There's also the potential that it creates a commoditization or inequality or a level playing field of humans and people that operate within those organizations. So the big question I have as it relates to this prediction is what happens to innovation? If organizations are all leveraging the same AI models, they've got access to all this clean data, what happens to competition and innovation. Do organizations simply lose that incentive and that motive to want to innovate, knowing that other organizations are going to be able to catch up using their own AI models and be able to predict the future and understand and anticipate what the future may hold? I don't know the answer to that part of it, but I do know that artificial intelligence has the potential to create the opportunity and the risk that organizations throughout the world become somewhat commoditized and have a level playing field as it relates to one another. The advent of technology has in many ways created a sense of paranoia with us as humans. We have geo-tracking on our phones and our wearable devices. We have wearable devices that are tracking our heartbeat and our health and our movements and our activity. So it's understandable that humans are becoming a bit skeptical or fearful of what technology can do if we keep heading in that direction. And one of the things I think could happen in the future is that instead of having wearables and having separate devices that are tracking our movement and our health and those sorts of things, I think it's not that far-fetched to think that there could be chips that are inserted into human bodies to do a lot of the work that's being done now by external devices. Now, this isn't anything new. I think Elon Musk and other futurists have talked about the potential for human chips. Some people may think it's a good thing. Some people may think it's a big risk and are fearful of it. But wherever you stand on the spectrum, it's reasonable to conclude that this evolution of technology and the intrusion into our personal lives is going to continue for better or for worse. And for that reason, the idea of human chips doesn't seem that far-fetched, or does it? 
when I think of enterprise technology, I think of a curve, an acceleration curve. And what's happening now in the 2020s is that enterprise tech is changing rapidly as it always has, but it's actually accelerated its pace of change. So in other words, if you look at the pace of change over the course of two or three years now versus two or three years, 10 or 20 years ago, the pace of change, I would argue, is a lot faster now in those two to three year windows. And for that reason, I think that it's reasonable to think that there's going to be an opportunity for upstarts and smaller software companies to chip away and undermine the market share of some of the big enterprise technology providers, some of the big ERP vendors like Microsoft and SAP and Oracle, for example. So in addition to these startups chipping away at the market share of these big tech providers, I think that the big tech providers themselves are going to have trouble keeping up with the change. They're just too big. They're not nimble enough. They don't move fast enough. For them to make a change to their big, massive, bloated, enterprise-wide technologies, it's going to take them a long time. So in years past, you would see software vendors like NetSuite or Salesforce or Workday. They really came in as an upstart and really disrupted the industry. And this was 20 years ago. So now you look at the opportunity to disrupt the industry, and I would argue the window is opening for smaller upstarts. And for that reason, I think those smaller upstarts are going to create more innovation, more disruption, and become more of a threat to the big ERP vendors and the big tech providers. And for that reason, I think eventually, I don't know when it's going to be, maybe in 20 years from now, you may find that these big three tech providers, SAP, Microsoft, Oracle, and others, are irrelevant in today's day and age. And what is perhaps the craziest and the most controversial prediction I'll make for the future is that there's going to be a big backlash against cloud and software as a service enterprise technologies. Not because the technology isn't viable, not because the world isn't moving towards cloud and software as a service right now, but because organizations have yet to feel the pain of what happens when they need to move off of those cloud or SaaS systems. So in other words, in years past, they could implement an enterprise-wide on-premise system 10 or 20 years ago, replace it. Not to say it wasn't a big deal. They're always painful anytime you make a system switch, but you at least owned the software. You had the software on-premise. You had the data on-premise. All of your integration was on-premise. And making that migration was relatively straightforward. Still painful, but somewhat straightforward. But now, we have yet to see the first big wave of cloud customers that decide we're going to move off of this cloud system and now move to another cloud platform. Software vendors have done a really good job of locking in their customers and making those switching costs extremely high and extremely painful. But yet we haven't seen the wave of customers that are ready to move off of their existing cloud system onto another cloud system. The other factor here is that cloud systems and especially software as a service multi-tenant cloud systems are a lot less flexible than on-premise systems. They simply can't be as flexible as on-premise systems over time because in order to scale and support thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of organizations using that product the way it was built, they have to be somewhat standardized or at least more standardized than the on-premise model. Not necessarily a good or bad thing on the surface until you realize organizations change, they evolve, they need to move quickly, they need the technology to keep up with their business needs. And the technology is going to continue to change and evolve, but not necessarily the way that the organizations that are using that technology are changing and evolving. Now, in addition, the third thing that's going to create some pressure in the long term for cloud customers is the fact that the total cost of ownership is going to be high. It's simply more expensive in the long term to use cloud solutions. Those high subscription costs are costs that never go away, much like leasing a car. And you can argue all you want that, well, we've saved money on our internal servers. We save money on maintaining that software, but you haven't really netted a cost savings. You just shifted the money you were spending internally over to a software vendor. They've added their markup and now you're paying more than you were in the long term. So this too is gonna to create pressure and a backlash against cloud technologies. So in the next several years, organizations are gonna to start to feel the pain of that high switching cost and that relative lack of flexibility. And there's gonna be a backlash. I don't know if it necessarily means that organizations are going to move back to on-premise systems. It could be that the pendulum ends up swinging back and falling somewhere in the middle. But all I can say is I feel like right now there's too much of a push towards cloud and software as a service, and we have yet to pay the price for the dark side and the downside risks of cloud solutions. 
And when that day comes, there's gonna be some sort of backlash against cloud and SaaS systems as we know it today. Technology is becoming an increasingly important part of our lives on a personal level, on a professional and business level as well. And when that happens, there's a lot of power and influence that comes along with that. And when that happens, typically the governments throughout the world are gonna to wanna to step in and regulate. They're gonna to wanna to make sure that people are not taken advantage of by technology providers. They're going to wanna to make sure that national security concerns are addressed and data protection is going to be addressed, things like that. And in fact, you're starting to see some of these trends already emerge when you think about GDRP, which is a data privacy law in Europe and other privacy laws that are emerging as a result of big data and compiling massive amounts of consumer data with tech providers. So I think over time, that trend's gonna to continue to the point where government's gonna be an active part of the technology landscape, and there's gonna be more government intervention and regulation of that technology. And this isn't meant to be a political statement, by the way. I'm not suggesting that this is a good or bad thing, but it seems to be somewhat inevitable that an industry as big and as influential and an industry that has so much to gain or lose in the modern day world it only makes sense that the government would eventually want to regulate that, or at least multiple governments throughout the world would want to regulate it. So keep an eye out for government regulations to be something that we see maybe in the 2030s increasing beyond where we are today. So these are some of the crazy predictions I have for the 2030s and beyond, but I'd love to hear your comments. What do you agree with? What do you disagree with? What would you add to the list? I'd love to hear your comments. Be sure to leave those below. And if you're looking for a more grounded view of digital transformation today, digital strategies today, and what you can be doing here in the 2020s, I encourage you to download our digital transformation report, which is an annual report we publish each year that covers a number of technology trends, best practices, strategies, et cetera, as well as independent software reviews and rankings in a whole host of different categories. So I encourage you to download that report. You can find that in the links below. I've also included a number of other links below, resources that are meant to help you define your digital strategies and execute on your digital transformations. So be sure to check out those links in the description field below. So I hope you found this information useful and hope you have a great day. Now, before I jump in to these crazy, what's it called again? Predictions? <laughs> okay. You can put this before that part where I say, oh, so, so let's jump right in. I just made that up. Uh, that's not a real phrase, but I'm, it is now. But wherever you stand, what did I say? Wherever you stand on the what? On the spectrum? The technology is going to be in, oh, oh almost had it, it. Ah, until I didn't. <laughs>